Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York City saxophonist Matt Parker. He's releasing an impressive new 2016 album called Present Time with his trio, and that will be keeping him busy. Over the course of our interview, he discussed a very pivotal trip to New Orleans he made at the age of 17, where he got to meet and play with the great Al Hurd. That was a start for his career in jazz, and it took off from there. At 19, he would move to New York City to study and play with cats like Junior Mance, Jane Ira Bloom, Reggie Workman, and the great Charlie Persip. He's gone on to play in South Africa and spots all over the place, giving his blend of jazz goods to the world. Please dig this interview, my friends. How you doing today, Joe? Hey, man, I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thanks for calling. Hey, thank you for taking some time to talk with me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I love the new album. So let me go ahead and dive right in. Before we start talking about present time, give me an idea of the activity that's been going on in your world lately. Well, it's been busy. I've been, uh, aside from releasing this second record, I uh, I just finished uh, mixing, doing the final mixes for my good friend Reggie Watkins, trombonist out of Pittsburgh, was co-producing a uh, his next record. Uh, and so we just spent the weekend working with the great Dave Darlington and, and, and getting these tracks right and um, looking to release uh, this music of the tribute album uh, in the sense of uh, the great Jimmy Nepper trombone player been doing that you know pretty hard so i'm just getting out of my head out of that music right now and gearing up for the week this week i have my release show for my for my new album present time and then doing all my other work i uh, i work pretty steadily here in in the city uh predominantly as the jazz saxophonist on the new york burlesque scene working uh you know quite a few shows uh a week you know, performing with burlesque performers and, and, and musicians uh, here in the city, uh, doing you know, putting together live bands for them and having a great time doing that. Uh, I got to tell you, Reggie Watkins told me one of the best jazz stories I've ever heard that involved Maynard Ferguson and Frank Sinatra. Has he ever told you that? Oh, yeah, I've, I heard that one from the horse's <laughs> mouth. Uh, I, I also had a, the great, that's how Reggie and I met and uh, was on Maynard's band. I'll never forget the night we were on the, traveling somewhere across the country on the on our bus, and and Maynard sitting down telling the story about taking Frank Sinatra's lady from him. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way Reggie orchestrated it was beautiful, and every visual was perfect. Like the guy, the big mafioso dude standing on the front porch, glowering with that LP and that sharpie. I mean, I could see the whole thing almost in a cartoon sense. You know, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and just the way they passed each other on that sound set, just the fact that Frank acknowledged that Maynard had some serious balls, that's a, that's a good storytelling right there. It, so. it, it really is. It really is. And Reggie tells it the best. If you're not going to hear it from Maynard, you definitely hear Reggie Watkins tell the story. <laughs> it's, absolutely. It's great. Yeah, it is. It is. So let's go ahead and talk about present time. That's a real powerhouse trio you assembled. Talk to me about the creative forces and kind of just the general flow of how this album came about. First, I mean, it, the album doesn't happen without Reggie and Alan, Reggie Quinterly on drums and Alan Hansen on bass. I'm very fortunate to to be able to call them two of my closest friends. And this music was kind of screaming for to be written. Uh, that's, you know, every time we get together and I've had the privilege of working with them for over 15 years, I, something needed, needed to be written right then. And the moment uh, needed to be right, it had to be now. I had to, I had to sit down and write it and get this trio recorded for myself, really. I mean, it was a, it's a documentation, you know, I'm just trying to document where I am in this process. You know, this, I'm looking at this as a very, uh, it's a very long game. And I want to be able to look back and, and see where I was. And there's no better way to do that than to, to just be in the moment. And that's kind of what we did. We went into the studio. We did quite a few shows leading up to the recording session. One of the things that I really 
love is is is, is being spontaneous. And so, so there were tunes on this record that they didn't see until the day of the recording session, and I hadn't played until the day of the recording session. You know, looking back at it now, it was that the smartest thing to do. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's what I did, though. I wanted to create an honest representation of me at any moment. When, when I'm writing, when I'm composing, when I'm performing in front of an audience, I, I, want, I open my soul. I try to let the audience see me for everything that I am, flaws and all. And that was so easy to do. It, it's so much, Reggie and Alan make that so much easier for me to do because of my trust and our friendship and, and the fact that I know that they're with me. And, and that, was, that was the idea behind Present Time, to capture that sentiment. Now, let's go back to your 2013 debut recording, Words, for, Words Put Together. Talk to me a little bit about that album and the difference between that one and this one. Well, Worlds Put Together is, is, is more of my motto, really. I mean, it's, I look around my life and I see all the people that are in it. And that, that's kind of the storyline behind the title, Worlds Put Together, is, is being able to have an art form where I can express myself and, and then at the very same time, somebody that comes from a completely different background, from a completely different continent, you know, it doesn't, you know, we can all kind of express ourselves and, and bring these worlds together. And for that project, you know, I, there were, there were so many people that I wanted on the record that I, I just, I had to stop somewhere. You know, that's one, one of the tracks on that record, uh, I kind of lost count, actually, how many people were in the studio at one time. The difference between between Wolf's Put Together and Present Time is probably best described. It's stripped down. I feel like um, having uh, a, a septet configuration for my first project uh, allowed my compositions to really be rich and I was able to write for that and I was able to move these little pieces around to endless degrees and I was curious how I would be able to still accomplish that in a smaller setting uh, with present time and even you know the the title of the, this new record is Matt Parker Trio Present Time and it's not a trio. I mean, I have more than three people on my record, and, and I think that's the continuation of Wolves Put Together. I can't help but be in, infected with the, the positivity of others. And so Emily Braden on, uh, is, blesses this record with her uh, amazing voice, who I just adore, and uh, Jerome Jennings comes in and, and lays down his talents as well on the track. Uh, on this trio record. <laughs> so let's let's kind of take a little bit of a departure from your albums right now and get to the beginnings of your life. You grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Talk to me about your childhood and what led you to get into a love of jazz and music. Well, I uh, I did grow up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and um, I'm the son of Kathy and Clayton Parker, and they are not musicians. My mom will be the first to tell you the only thing she plays is the radio, and she plays that really well. Um, th there was always music on in the house. They always had records. Some of my earliest memories are my mom and dad putting on their favorite records and listening to them with them and dancing around the house with them and uh, lots of road trips. We drove everywhere and, you know, cassette tapes and uh, in the car. My dad was in, uh, had a, still does, has a, a, a a great appreciation for this artist, Leon Redbone. He just loved him. And, and the funny thing was my mom was not, she didn't share the same uh, enthusiasm with his, his recordings as my dad did. And so I think some of the earliest things about music that I can remember are seeing that kind of dialogue between my parents of my dad loves this music and my mom not so much. <laughs> Uh, and and what that entailed, and my mom trying to, like, my dad was pumping gas, she would take the cassette tapes and kind of hide them, you know, and put on put her favorite cassette tapes up. And uh, and then my, you know, and just that kind of, that playfulness that 
now that I look back on, I see is is a direct result of what music can offer and what it offers all of us, musicians or non-musicians. You know, Fort Lauderdale is, uh, it's very rich. South Florida in general is, is very rich uh, with all kinds of music from many different parts of the world. As I got into music, I was, I guess you would say I was a little late to the game. When I started first beginning band, I was 14 years old. I later met uh, you know, I, I've met many people, and a lot of the people that I was growing up with in South Florida, they started when they were eight, nine, ten years old, and so there was a little bit of this uh, sense of always uh, playing catch up while I was in Florida. That's, and that actually, now that I'm saying that out loud, that's kind of how I still feel. I still feel like I, oh, I gotta just keep working because you know these guys got the, all these years on me. Yeah, South Florida was good for me in that respect. I I, I enjoyed when I was younger. There was there were always uh, summer festivals. There was always a beach concert. There was always a, a you know live bands at a park, and uh, and I believe that's that's how I why I fell in love with it was through my environment uh, outside of my home necessarily. Was around seeing seeing musicians play, I thought that was. I, I remember just being like, I, that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to be on that stage and performing. So let me ask you this. In all of the music that your parents played for you, was there one album that just really blew your, your doors down, jazz-related, that was like, wow? Yes. The first, well, I'm sure there's a few. I'm sure there's a few. Um, the one that comes to mind that's jazz-related would have to be a Harry Connick Jr. record that my mom had. And my mom just loved it was I believe it was the the soundtrack to when Harry met Sally and he uh, th- that's just a great score and it's 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 made up of of Harry's band with Harry's big band and uh, I I remember hearing that and being like what is this this is fantastic and I, that, that that was around the time that I first started playing saxophone and I, I remember being uh, totally taken by uh, I. I, I didn't know it at the time, but now I've gone back and great tenor saxophonist uh, who's here in New York, Ned Gould, and being just totally like, wow, this guy, what what kind of sound is this? This is fantastic. Well, let me ask you this. What was it about specifically the saxophone that made you pick that instrument to play? There's actually a silly story about how it actually happened. I wanted to play drums when I went to beginning band, and I, I think uh, probably a lot of kids that don't know that much about music, probably want to say the drums. And they, they said, no, you can't play the drums. And so then I moved on and I said, well, I like that one. And I pointed to a trumpet. And they said, no, 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 that's not going to be good for you. I had braces at the time. And they, they discouraged me from picking up the trumpet. And then they had, they had uh, uh, an oboe, a flute, and an alto saxophone. And they said, this, you can choose one of these. And out of those three, I thought the, the, the alto looked fantastic and took it home, and that was it. I'll, I'll, I still remember the smell of opening that, that first saxophone case. That be, is it a Bundy, and getting it home and showing my parents and trying to figure out how to put it together. And it was, it was more comical than anything, but I, it was, it was, I'll never forget it. And I, I, kinda, I never let go of the saxophone after that point. Sweet. Well, let me let me ask you this. What was it about the sound and the playing or even the persona of Lester Young and Roland Kirk that moved you so much? Well, let's, let's start with Lester Young because I, I'm, I'm much more, um, my timeline goes a lot further with him. I My dad turned me on uh, to Count Basie when he found out that I was going to start playing the saxophone. Actually, one of the very first musicians that I met when I started playing was this drummer named Duffy Jackson. My dad invited him over to our house, and he sat down, and he talked about Count Basie. And he said, you have to check out Lester Young. And so that's what I did. And I, I fell in love with... I've always wanted, my, I've always wanted to be a vocalist. I, I, I can't really carry a tune uh, when it comes to singing. I, as soon as I, I heard Lester Young and Billie Holiday sing together, I was just, you know, that was it for me. That was... I I wanted to sound like Lester. I wanted to I wanted to get to play with vocalists the way he did, and that's kind of carried on throughout 
throughout my uh, development, obviously you start being, you know, I started learning about people that were also influenced by him and like, uh, and, and so the, the, they then became big blocks in my development as well. Like, uh, just to name one or two is, would be probably Dexter Gordon was a huge one when I was first starting. I had, I went and got every single record I could find of Dexter Gordon. R- Rashawn Roland Kirk, he, I mean, I really didn't get into his music until 2013 when I, after recording Worlds Put Together, and I let a few people hear it, and they started mentioning that they heard a lot of Rashawn Roland Kirk's influence in, in that record. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got better, I better go get some, some Kirk records right away because if they're saying I'm, uh, you know, I'm influenced by them, I want to at least know what they're talking about. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, there was many records that actually I had heard before and just was, wasn't quite aware of what I was listening to at the time. But I've flown to really just love his playing and his approach and what he brings to the music, his, sense of community is is really astounding to me the way he is able to bring in doesn't matter who's playing with him it's all of a sudden everyone's sounding you know they're they're all on the same road that sonic road that that he kind of is like the head of the train you know he's kind of saying which way we're going to go which you know what track we're going to go down and i i really dig that about his playing he's very melodic and he he stretches sound for me. I think it's more than being able to play two instruments at the same time, if that makes any sense. I mean, yeah, no. I know a lot of people think that's the first thing you think of, and maybe that was the first thing I thought of when I when I, before really delving into his music. You know, I'd encourage anybody to just go get ten thousand return of ten thousand or five thousand pound man. It's, uh, it's a great it's a great record. Great organist uh, Trudy Pitt of Philadelphia is on that. Uh, yeah, they're they're both really. Uh, great influences. It's just tremendous artists and it's, it's hard not to love them. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. I agree. So let's go into your lineage of your life. At 17, you go to New Orleans, you meet and play with Al Hurd. Then you get to meet Pete Fountain and, and, and you get all of this advice and this experience. What was that like going down there at that age and getting that? I mean, that was pretty intense. It was life changing. You know, I was only down there for just, just you know, we're saying, I'm saying three months. It was, it was probably 11 weeks that I was there. And it, I think about it every day. You know, I've been living in New York City for over 15 years now, you know, and I, I'm still, I still, not a day goes by that I don't think about those three months. Being young, moving, you know, having the permission of, you know, my family to, to, to leave their nest, to experience this town that, is famous for all kinds of things, you know. Um, it was the first time I really became aware of my own independence. I had to be confident with my own independence, and had to be had to be aware of everything uh, around me and my environment and and all these things. And that that's even before getting into any of the knowledge that the city has to offer. That's just being, you know, a teenager, just not having any parental supervision. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, the, I, I had the privilege of, of working with these three local musicians, and it was a trio. It was an organ trio, and uh, I was the fourth member. And the youngest guy in the band, I believe, was 47 years old. And then the organ player was in his mid-70s, and uh, Bob Crane, the clarinetist, was 69. And these guys just took me under their wing. I, I, you know, I went, I went to New Orleans. I, I didn't know how to read music. I didn't understand uh, theory or harmony. And these guys were, you know, teaching me to use my ears and teaching me how to react and to communicate with an audience every day, you know, six days a week, 10 hours a day. And then when we were done, it wasn't, it wasn't the cool 10 hours of the day. We started at 11 o'clock in the morning, and we would play through the the whole day outside at the gazebo and on Decatur Street. That when our when our day was over, either Bob or, or or Joe West, the organ player, would take would take me with them, and they would. And that's how they 
introduced, they took me over to Al Hurt and introduced me to him one night, and uh, he invited me up on stage. I wish I could remember what we played. Uh, I think I was more petrified than anything uh, yeah. when I was in that moment. But um, I went, I would keep going back and, and seeing him, and I kind of wish I would have asked more questions now. You know, I, you know, now that he's not with us, you know, it would have been great to kind of pick, pick all of their brains more. But I think that's okay, too. I was young, and... It's all forgivable when you're young, that's for sure. <laughs> so at 19, you make your trek to New York City in 99, and you get to play alongside uh, Junior Mance and Reggie Workman and Charlie Persip. That had to be another level of mind-blowing growth for you. Indeed. I mean, the whole reason why I was able to come to New York was because of Reggie Workman and Jane Ira Bloom. And uh, in an audition that I did, uh, for them at the new school and basically being given an opportunity to, they saw something in me that they thought uh, was worth investing in. And, and, and they brought me, uh, they brought me to New York. I remember just trying to learn everything I could about them. And then, you know, you, you, you know, now it's different. Now you have the internet that you, you can type Reggie Workman's name in and just in one shot just be, blown away by his credentials, it does make me sound much older than I feel like. I <laughs> but I guess in 99, I mean, it wasn't quite as accessible, you know? Mm-hmm. YouTube was not, you know, this thing <laughs> where you could just check out everything. You know, I remember going, you know, going to a library, going to the Lincoln Center Library, and and just trying to check out music. You know, you could, in New York City, the New York Public Library System, here's a little shout out to them. What an amazing thing. You get a library card and you can check out music. And so, and that's what I did. And, and the school library as well had quite an extensive um, uh, collection of all of these great recordings. My first year there, I was able to, um, they gave me this little award, which was called the Zoot Sims Award. And, and that was the first opportunity I actually had to play outside of a school with Great musician. Never forget playing with Junior Mance and just absolutely falling in love with the way he played the piano and the spirit that he would bring to the piano. That became for many years. I mean, he was he was my. I would talk to him about what I was trying to do and and ask for advice and what to do and what I should you know should and should not be trying to uh, trying to do. And his his answer was always the same. He's like, just be yourself. That was never enough for me at the time. Now it is. Now I, I, I revel in being myself. Very cool. Yeah, and I guess that all comes along with wisdom and age. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about your traveling. You've been to South Africa. You went to uh, perform with the Cape Town Youth Choir. Um, you were also in a film, John Wick. Talk to me about what it's like to put your music out there for other audiences, about traveling and, and getting involved with putting it out there in front of an audience. It's fantastic. <laughs> It's absolutely incredible. <laughs> How's that? Um, <laughs> it's, there's really nothing better to do. I mean, you get uh, an opportunity to play something for somebody that you don't know. It just puts a whole new perspective on what you're trying to do. Uh, and for me, I it probably I think the best way I can describe it is it, it's yeah, it changes you a little bit. It gives you a totally different perspective, especially when you go to a different country uh, or to any any new environment. And I I think that's what's infectious is and if not just for me but for so many of my peers and 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 mentors i mean they all say the same thing i mean the more diversity you can find yourself playing in the more you you actually can can grow from those experiences it's easy, you know you, we're not talking about the travel and the layovers or the miscommunications of hotel rooms <laughs> yeah you know that 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 side of things yeah, you know, th- there's a lot of really big ups and downs with that. But once you're on stage and once or once you're in front of an, a new audience, there's no greater feeling. There's this, it's a moment of, are they going to like it? Uh, are they going to hate it? Will they understand me? Are they going to stay? Uh, you know, all these different thoughts that, that go through my mind, I only can really, it, it, it really puts you on your toes. It, it, I'm the best right before I go on stage. I'm well, I'm very aware. 
Let me ask you this question. Not the message that you're trying to put out through your music, but, you know, I always hear that, and it's always very interesting from coming from my perspective of not being a musician but having admiration for musicians and the music that's produced, that there's a conversation that happens. And I always hear that more specifically with jazz than any other idiom, that there's this conversation that happens. So my question is this. What kind of conversation are you having with us as listeners? That's a good question. I like that. The kind of conversation that I'd like to think, that I think that I'm, I'm trying to portray is, is a conversation of, I've got you. i got your back. You guys can trust me, and we're going to go on a ride. There's something really special about comedians, perfect example. I love comedians. I love stand-up comedians. Now, I think the, the, those are the bravest, that's the bravest art form there is. I mean, you're all by yourself on a stage, and you're trying to communicate something to an audience. And I think in order for that to work is trust. And in order to gain the trust, you have to, you have to, you know, show that you are going to be there for the people. There's love is something that I think about. Laughter is something that I think about. And I, and I hope those those two things come across the most while I'm playing, especially my own music. Um, but just in general, something that I like to think that I bring as an artist to any group that I'm in is this sense of uh, I'm just trying to be in that moment and invite you to be in it with me. And it's going to be okay. Right on. I won't drop you. I won't let you go. You won't fall down. And hopefully we'll all come out the other side. Uh, a little happier and, and, and more fulfilled. You know, we've touched on some of your jazz heroes, those that have influenced you. So I ask you this. If you could get into a time machine, go back in time, and catch any act, specifically jazz, who would you see and where would you go? Wow. Well, I would probably go see I'd probably go see the band. I'd probably go to Kansas City and see Count Basie. I would, I'd love to be in I'd love to be in that room and see those guys thrown down the way they did and I mean it would be great to it would it would be I mean, there's so many right I mean God, yeah. that's a tricky one yeah how many rides do I get on this time machine um <laughs> so you might have a, a, a new uh, a new television program here you know it's a, yeah. a time machine each episode you could take a different musician and go to a different time and yeah our- I think Count Basie that, that there's just there's so many great cats so many of my, my heroes are in that band you know and um uh, and they were swinging, and people were dancing and loving it and sweating. And, and you know, they were in it for the music. You know, the audience was, you know, and the the band was up there doing it for the So, yeah, that, that would be a pretty exciting thing to get to see live. You know, and one of the beauties of being in Kansas City is I'll get down on 18 and buy it. A vastly different landscape, but you really feel what was going on during that quadrant, during the days where we were dubbed Harris in the Plains. I mean, it was... Every place was a juke joint going crazy, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I get me speckled. That's why that question came about. There's there's so many avenues that you can go down with that. So let me ask you this on a personal level. What's the greatest thing for you about waking up every day? The greatest thing about waking up every day? Being me? Yeah. Oh, uh, my wife and kid. Now, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, <laughs> it's probably a different answer. <laughs> but now I get to wake up. I got a little two-year-old, Theodore, and and he he's just incredible. And 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 my wife Shana, she is, she puts up with me and and being married to a jazz saxophonist in New York City. I mean, it's, there's a lot of things to be grateful for, and in, in, in just that, yeah, I would have to say my family is probably the best thing that I I I think the first thing I think about. I mean, once that passes over and I have my cup of coffee, it's I love getting to write. I love I love working on my craft. Uh, I'm a you know student for the rest of my life. I know that I'm 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 here to learn. I'm just trying to learn as as quickly as I can. I wish to learn faster, and that's something that I work very hard on trying to figure out how to, how can I retain information. And uh, there's just so much good stuff out there. There's just so much good stuff out there. I can't you know I, I'm going to bring it right back to you now. It's like I'm. I, uh, looking at, you know, jazz and it's, man, I could literally spend a year listening to all of your incredible interviews, you know, where there's so much really in, 
important information that all these great artists that you have on there are are offering. You know, little things like that is what I look forward to every day. And you're totally right. That's the thing that is, is amazing about jazz is that I've had people that will say, isn't there a ceiling to who you can talk to? Never. There's always a 90-year-old. Yeah. There's always an aspiring 16-year-old. There's always somebody on every corner of this country and this world that's doing this music that has a story and that has that Reggie Watkins quote or has your quote. That there's, there's a plethora. It's, it's an amazing expanse of total movement that never slows down. It's always moving forward every single day. Um, Absolutely. And so let me ask you this. As a man that has dedicated his life to the jazz craft, tell me why you love jazz. I love jazz. It allows, it, it's, it's a space. It's a place to go. Because of jazz, I, I, I'm who I am today. I, as soon as I realized that the first time I, I realized I could improvise, that was one of the happiest moments in my life. I mean, I, I realized that there was something that I could say. Um, and so for that, I'm forever grateful. I mean, I'm not, who's to say what would have happened if I, I think some, I'm not probably not the only person that's ever thought like, what would I be doing if I wasn't playing music? But when I think about it, I have no idea what I would be doing because when I found jazz, I realized well, I could do this. This is something, I, you know, it, it allows me every day to look at myself in the mirror uh, and look at my soul in the mirror, you know, if you were to say it like that, maybe, and 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 really kind of keep myself in check and deal with my demons. It allows me to do so many things that make me a better person. I think. Beautiful. You did just mention that if I would have asked you about the greatest thing about waking up ten years ago, it would have been different than today. So let me ask you this: We get on the phone ten years from now, and I say, "What's been going on with you lately? What are you going to want to tell me's happened?" I want to say that I have a whole bunch more records made, that I'm still happy. I want to be happy. That's my goal. I don't Perfect. need to be rich. I don't need to be famous. I just want to be happy doing what I want to do with my family and my life. And I hope in 10 years I can tell you that, Joe. I really do. So let me ask you this, my final question. I think you probably have answered it in, in little vignettes of what we've strung together over this interview. But... Everybody has their version of you. Your immediate family does. Your fans do. Your management people and family, everybody. But who do you think you are? How, how much longer do we have on this interview, man? Is this <laughs> <old>? No. <laughs> uh, I think I'm a nice guy. I think I'm a nice guy. I think I have a lot of strength. I think I have a lot of perseverance. Perseverance is kind of my motto. Uh, I have a plaque that my father gave me when I moved out when I was 17, and it's now on my son's door. Perseverance, I, I'm going to persevere. I'm, I'm going to continue doing what I think is good for myself, but not only for myself, for the ones closest to me, and then hopefully to people I won't be able to reach today but can reach at another time. I, you know, I want to do good things for good for people. Beautiful, man. I think you are a nice guy. And, uh, Thanks. and, and, man, I appreciate you taking some time today and opening up, giving me your story. And really, man, when I got this album in the mail, I was like, I gotta talk to this cat. This is top shelf stuff. Um, it's great. It's a great album, man. I really appreciate you taking time to listen to it. And, uh, and any, you know, it's great to get that kind of feedback. I can't, you know, everyone that I talk to that has taken the time to listen to the music, I have to say thank you because it's um that's why I'm doing this and uh if you're not listening to it um you know it's it's purpose is not it's, it's not being met so you're you're helping me uh uh, live a life of purpose so I appreciate that thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York Kansas City and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz and thanks to Matt Parker for his music his insights and his cool if you want to hear more interviews go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz until next time enjoy the music my friend friends. Neon Jazz.